A few years ago, I got into a Wikipedia battle with an anonymous person. You're all uh, familiar with Wikipedia, I'm sure. It's an, it's an, a, an open source, I guess you would call it, uh, a website that has information, you know, millions of articles about different subjects, and anybody can go in and change Wikipedia. Well, I stumbled across the Second Great Awakening, the Wikipedia page that, that speaks about that event, and I noticed that Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, was listed on that page as being one of the, one of the leaders. And I saw that and just said, uh, no, Joseph Smith does not belong here because the Second Great Awakening was a Protestant movement. And so I went in and I deleted his name. And then out of curiosity, I went back a few days later and I looked and it had reappeared. And I said, Joseph Smith was not part of the, great, uh, the Second Great Awakening. So I went in and I deleted his name. And then a few days later, I went back and somebody had put it back. So this went on for a little while. Now I have no clout on Wikipedia whatsoever. And so they thought that I was like vandalizing the page by removing him from it. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, maybe there's, there's a, uh, a cabal of Mormons who, who ensure that Joseph Smith's name is kept on the Wikipedia page under the second great awakening. I ended up losing. So it's still on there. And they basically restricted me from being able to, to change it anymore. So I would encourage all of you, go on the Second Great Awakening Wikipedia page and take his name off. It should not be there. Now, um, it's understandable that so many people believe that a, a, a religious group like the Mormons uh, uh, should be a part of, of that movement. They should be counted as a Christian group. But it's understandable only because a lot of people are not clear on what Christianity truly is. So that's the only reason that there would be any confusion there. But it, there's also a, a more subtle and a deeper irony. And the irony is that there was what we might call theological weakening or theological declension that set in at the time of the Second Great Awakening. So ironically, you could see how in the aftermath of this theological weakening, more people are just less clear on what Christianity is so that some could even be confused in thinking that, that Mormonism is kind of, a, kind of in the main line of the Protestant or even Christian tradition. Well, you know that last week we we explored uh, the the first Great Awakening, and this week we're going to look at the second Great Awakening. Now, uh, this morning we enter into the third and the final phase of church history, what what I'm calling the modern church, and I've, uh, I've, I've settled on the date 1792 to the present. Now, there are reasons uh, for that, and a lot of them are, are my own reasons. Uh, why use 1792 as the dividing line between the Reformation Church and the modern church? mainly because of the onset of this uh, European movement, especially French and, and German movement known as the Enlightenment that happened, that, that started at the very, uh, in the last few years of the uh, 18th century, but also the modern missions movement. And what we'll see, especially next week, is that the results of the modern missions movement um, have changed the face of the church today more than anything else that's happened in the past 300 years. So if you were here from the beginning, back in, uh, when was it, April or May we started, we began with the early church. We looked at the medieval or or the uh, medieval church or the church of the Middle Ages. Then we've just concluded the Reformation and now we're we're on into the the last phase of the the modern church. Um, Now the impact, oh, ah, there was my little... uh, my little graphic for Wikipedia battle. I'm a little bit out of, uh, out of uh, order here. Well, anyway, uh, the impact of the first great awakening, which we saw was from the 1730s to the 1760s, had worn off by the time of the American Revolution and the Revolutionary War in the uh, uh, latter part of the 1770s and early uh, 1780s. And that was mainly through the impact of deism, right? Deism is this idea that, well, there's a God and he created everything, but he, he created and then he has just sort of put it on the shelf and he's just letting it do its own thing. He's sort of letting the clock wind down on its own. That was an idea that really came in vogue in the last few decades of the 1700s. But also uh, the, the writings of, uh, associated with the French Revolution, that, that was uh, the other thing that caused the effects of the First Great Awakening to wear off. Now, the years 1790 to 1830 are the approximate dates of the second great wave of uh, revivalism that broke out in the colonies that has become known as the Second Great Awakening. Um, And just as the First Great Awakening was a series of smaller revivals, so was the the second. 
Um, now, the influence of the Second Great Awakening, it kind of divides into um, eastern and western regions. Now, remember at this time, like California was not settled. It, there was only Indians that basically lived from the Appalachian Mountains, sort of Missouri and, and, and west. And uh, the first phase of the Second Great Awakening occurred in New England. And so the far uh, northeast, today we would call it Connecticut, New York, uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts, those types of areas. And then a little bit later, a couple decades later, the influence began to move toward the south, especially in Kentucky. Again, this is all frontier. This was kind of the, the, the wild frontier in America uh, back, in those, back in those days. Now, um, the first revival that began this movement was at um, a college called Hampton Sydney College in Virginia in 1787, when a few students became concerned about the state of their souls. Um, um, whoop, that's a little typo. Um, the revival started there, and it spread to Washington College and eventually south into the Presbyterian Church. So it began there, and then it gradually moved south. In New England, a revival among Congregationalists began at Yale University in 1802. This was kind of another spark of revival. Under the leadership of the President Timothy Dwight, who was also the grandson of Jonathan Edwards, it then spread to Dartmouth up in New Hampshire and then to Williams College. Now, that was the first phase of the revivals in the Northeast and among the Congregationalist churches. Now, one thing I neglected to, to point out uh, last week, and I'll mention it now because it's, it's really fascinating, and it's, this is one of those interesting tidbits of information that you can um, uh, put in your toolkit. Uh, anytime somebody says, you Christians, you're anti-intellectual, right? You're anti-education, you're just backwards, you know, fundamentalist types, you actually believe the Bible, that's ridiculous. Well, I'm going to give you um, something for your, your toolkit against a skeptic who says that about the Christian faith. Last week, I neglected to explain the educational impact of the First Great Awakening. During and in the wake of the Awakening, the following colleges were founded to promote Christian education in the colonies. Number one, the University of Pennsylvania. The first building at the University of Pennsylvania was built so that George Whitfield could preach. He wouldn't have to preach out in the field. They, they, they constructed a huge building for him. Uh, ben Franklin was, is really credited with founding the University of Pennsylvania, and he wanted a purely secular curriculum. Well, the trustees that he gathered weren't up for that, and so the initial curriculum of the University of Pennsylvania was Anglican, and this was in the year 1740. Secondly, Princeton. Now, Princeton was founded by the Presbyterians in 1746 because Yale University expelled David Brainerd. You see, David Brainerd was one of those who was very sympathetic to the, awakening, uh, to the, the First Great Awakening. In fact, Bra uh, David Brainerd and Jonathan Edwards, I explained, were very close. Brainerd lived in Jonathan Edwards' house for the, past few, the last few months of his life before he died of tuberculosis. And, uh, and, and, and he, ended up, he ended up dying there in David Brainerd's house. In fact, this is kind of a, kind of a um, uh, what's the word, kind of a tender um, truth about that relationship is that Jonathan Edwards had a 17-year-old daughter by the name of Jerusha Edwards. It's very likely, or we know that Jerusha really took care of David Brainerd as he was dying of tuberculosis in those months, and they fell in love. David Brainerd died, and a few months later, Jerusha contracted tuberculosis and also died. Mm. And, yet, and yet, Jonathan Edwards had no regrets whatsoever that she had really nursed David Brainerd, that she had, had been so caring and loving of him. That was how highly Edwards thought of David Brainerd. Well, David Brainerd got expelled from Yale University and a group of Presbyterians said, you're going to exp expel David Brainerd because he actually believes that the Great Awakening is a work of God? We'll form our own college. And it was known as the College of New Jersey. And later on, it took the name, the, uh, uh, the name of Princeton University. Huh. Thirdly, isn't that interesting? I love that. I know. Um, next is Columbia University, which was founded by the Church of England in 1754. Next, Brown was founded by the Baptist in 1764. Rutgers was found, formed by the Dutch Reformed. And Dartmouth was uh, uh, brought about by the Congregationalists in 1769. Now, five of these six schools are known as the what? Ivy the Ivy League schools. You have Cornell that came later. 
You know, you, you had uh, Harvard uh, and Yale had already been had already been founded. In fact, uh, one other little educational thing is Harvard was founded in 1636 uh, by a uh, from a bequest given by a pastor by the name of John Harvard. He gave some money, some buildings, and in, uh, in his personal library to train pastors. That is why Harvard was founded. There was theological weakness that set in at Harvard. And so I believe the year was 1701. So Yale was founded out of the uh, kind of the decline and the slippage that was happening at Harvard. Once Yale started to, to decline within one generation, that's usually as long as seminaries last. And then they fall into error. One generation. When that fell apart, they founded Princeton. Now, Princeton actually lasted a long time. And I can I am positive that at least two people in this room know what seminary was founded when Princeton uh, became very, very liberal theologically at the turn of the 20th century. And what school was that? Westminster. Westminster Theological Seminary. So that is one of the flagship, you could say, denominations of our uh, uh, seminaries of our, of our denomination. So folks, don't ever let anybody tell you that those who believe the Bible and take it serious are just ignorant, you know, backward fundamentalists. That is a completely ignorant thing to say, especially... In light of of this. Now, the the second great awakening had some educational movement to it. There were some colleges that were founded, but it wasn't anything like what we had at the time of the first great awakening. All right. So let's go back to the um, the uh, uh, to the colonies and sort of the way the uh, the the, uh, America as we know it today was was settled. In the first 150 years after the time the pilgrims arrived, the settlers remained mostly in the east and within the 13 colonies. But after the Revolutionary War, many settlers crossed the Appalachian Mountains and populated the vast lands to the west. By 1820, a quarter of the population of the colonies, um, uh, of, of the population in America, resided outside the original colonies. There was a population of about 10 million at the time. These people ended up participating in the excitement surrounding the second great awakening uh you know you you think that they started in massachusetts and they gradually moved uh, a little bit west and south and i don't know about you if i if i looked up at the appalachian mountains i would be like let's just stay here like i mean getting our wagons over those hills i mean they're not like the rockies but let's become people of the sea we'll 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 do a lot of fishing and stuff (laughs) like that in fact this is not in my notes but it's coming to mind so it has to come out that uh, Australia was settled almost the exact same way and that the East Coast was colonized and they looked at this vast area to the West and they're like, nah, we'll just stay here. (laughs) Um, uh, A good friend of mine, one of my seminary professors uh, is from Australia and he says, America has this can-do spirit. We'll go through the plains and we'll settle and we'll get to California. He said, Australia has this distinct can't-do spirit. We'll just stay here, you know. We'll stay here. So gradually they went, they went west. Well, the Presbyterians were initially uh, the first to take revival meetings to the frontier through a pastor by the, names of, by the name of James McGreedy. In 1796, McGreedy went to rural Kentucky and began to preach. So he went south and he went west. His preaching was extraordinary. Many who heard him, they fainted, they shook, they howled, they shouted, they sang, and thousands flocked to hear him preach. And they camped out for weeks at a time. These became known as camp meetings. People would come in their wagons and they would stay for nonstop services for week after week. It's a little bit like um, Woodstock or something like that, like a music festival. You know, they would go and instead of hearing bands and smoking pot, they would hear preachers and they would, I don't know, drink water or whatever they did, you know. Um, But that's a little bit uh, a little bit what this was was like. Now, one of um, McGreedy's students, a guy by the name of Barton Stone, he went off on his own and he began these similar meetings. And one of the most notable meetings was held at a play, an area called Cane Ridge in Kentucky in the year 1801. So this was one of the first major tent meetings. And this is, a, this is an, a, a, an image of, of what it is. You've got, um, I mean, you, you had as many as 20,000 people that came to this area over a, a period of several months. You can see all of their tents in the back, and you have here this uh, this uh, extraordinary preacher who's preaching the uh, the gospel. So <clears throat> it was the pre- the Presbyterian James McGreedy who began these revival type meetings, but it was the Methodists and the Baptists who really perfected them. 
Okay, so it ended up being the Methodists and the Baptist churches that grew extraordinarily large as a result of the revivals of the, uh, of the Great Awakening. They planted churches in the, in the process. So Presbyterians and Congregationalists, they tended to stay east and, and northeast. Um, and Judy, isn't it the case that uh, mo- you have Congregationalist churches still in almost all the small towns in New England? Yeah, very, very much so. Um, n- not a lot of gospel witness in them, unfortunately. Uh, there are certainly exceptions, but uh, the norm would be for these churches, a lot of them to be very just kind of humanistic and kind of worksy, do goody, but not a lot of, uh, not a lot of good news or, or gospel. Now, the numbers of the uh, Methodists and the Baptists exploded during these revivals. Get this. In 1770, there were 20 Methodist churches. 90 years later, there were 19,000. Wow. Right? So we're talking about a uh, huge, just an explosive growth that, that happens in less than 100 years for the Methodists. And one reason was because the way they did their ministry was these circuit riders. You had Methodist uh, ministers who would get on their horseback and they would go for months and month and month after, month at a time. And they would go all across the frontier and go from village to village preaching the gospel, um, catechizing people, right? Strengthening them and, and building them up in the faith and, um, and ensuring that their, their flocks were well looked after. So that was the, that was the model um, that, that was used in, in, in those days. Now, I'm going to get a little deep on, uh, on you here. Let, I want you to think about this for a moment. Let, let's, ponder, uh, let's ponder a little bit of the nature of the kind of the Calvinistic impulse and the Arminian impulse um, and, and the settling of America and why it is that certain groups became popular. So think of this. <clears throat> the Methodists and the Baptists were predominantly Arminian in their theology. The Methodists were like exclusively Arminian. And then most Baptists, but not all Baptists, were Arminian. Do you all know what the word Arminian means? No. Right? Okay, I'll explain it. So an Arminian says that the main reason that I'm a Christian is because I decided to put my trust in Jesus Christ, okay? I was the main actor in me coming to faith. A Calvinist would say that, yes, I did make a decision for Christ, but the reason I did uh, make a decision for Christ is because God um, eternally predestined me, right? So even before I was born, he set his electing love on me, okay? So that's as short as I can make it. Those are the differences, So um, these groups were mainly Armenian in their theology, unlike the Presbyterians. So a good Presbyterian, anyway, in those days was supposed to be Reformed and Calvinistic in their theology. All right, so the connection between Armenianism and the success of the Methodists and Baptists in America is a connection worth pondering. Let's think about this. The idea that you hold your destiny in your own hands is in keeping. That's in agreement with a deeply American way of thinking, isn't it? The idea that you get to decide what you want to do seems more in line with Arminianism, right? Because it's up to you. It's up to you to decide. Are you going to, you know, in salvation, are you going to choose Christ or are you going to reject Christ? And in the same way with the settlers, are you going to get out there and make something happen in the world? Are you going to provide for your family? Are you going to build a business? Are you going to sit around like a lazy bum and expect it to just happen? Okay, let's keep thinking. On the other hand, it seems more Calvinistic to believe that things in the world are basically in place and there's no need to upset the social structures or social order. Now, this idea is strongly compatible with monarchy and the autocracy in England, right? In England, uh, then, and I think in a lot of ways still now, there's this idea that there is kind of a fixed social structure. There's a social order. And if you're born uh, in a, a very working class, uh, as into a working class family, for the rest of your life, you will be working class. If you're born where your family owns uh, extensive uh, property and land, where you, your family doesn't really have to work because they're just getting so much passive income, then the chances are you're going to stay within that class uh, for your whole life. Therefore, it makes sense that the Second Great Awakening occurred in the colonies and not in England. There was not this revival, revivalistic movement in England. In England, there's a settled social and political order. People basically accept the way things are and are content with it. You can maybe see how that mindset is compatible with Calvinism. God has an order and he has given decrees that are um, unchangeable. So the mindset that the settlers had who came over is they didn't like that system, right? 
they didn't like the idea that there's sort of this fixed order. And so they, a lot of them fled to America for that reason, because they wanted to let there be uh, um, uh, a, a close link between what they put into life and what they get out of life. Right? So that was why a lot of people fled and came to America. Um, they didn't want a king. They wanted to be king of their own destiny. Now, you, if, you're, if you're careful in your thinking, you could see how that, well, that could even become a problem too. That could become a sin problem as well. They wanted to be able to do well for themselves on the basis of the effort that they put in. Now, how many of you agree with that kind of American spirit that, you know, what you put in should d- dictate what, what comes out? How many of you are, are on board with that? I like that. I, I, I'm, I mean, in that sense, I'm very American. I, 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 that makes sense. I, now, I, I believe that, that there, there is, uh, there's a group that, you know, there are people in society who are simply unable to do for themselves. I, I mean, r- really cannot by, because of, of sickness, because of age and infirmity. And those, I believe that we do need to have social safety nets for those people. But when it comes to an able-bodied person, I think that, it, that, that it's up to you to get out there and decide to, um, to make something happen. Now, um, I hope this doesn't get me in trouble, but I will say we, we have lived in England and we have lived in America. We loved living in England. It was three of the best years of our lives, and um, it, was, it was wonderful in a lot of ways. I will say at the same time that Nicole and I, we were very struck by how hard it is to initiate like a business and to get that going and to really try to get out there and do something new on your own. That way of thinking is not in many English people's minds, at least not among our group of friends. And we were we we in general were around a very well educated group of people because we were in in a university uh, city in Durham. But that way of of thinking is not um, is not very common there. And frankly, there is so much red tape and there are so many uh, obstacles to you setting up your own business that in my view, if a, say a businesswoman or a businessman had a million dollars to invest, where should I invest it in the globe? I would say you are not going to want to invest it in, in the UK. It's all going to get eaten up by all the, all the bureaucracy that has to be paid for, right? Now contrast that with in America when I was 18, I worked, well, when I was 16, 17, I worked for a guy doing tree removal and uh, it didn't take long before I realized, boy, this guy's making a lot of money and he's not a hard worker. Maybe I'll save up some of my own money and I'll do my own thing. So I did. I worked this big land clearing job uh, for about two weeks and made a few thousand dollars, went and bought my own chainsaw, bought my gear. And then in order to set up a business in Atlanta, uh, you have to go to the, uh, the county annex. That's where I went. And uh, you go into the business office and you fill out a piece of paper that says, I'm starting a business. You just put in your name and your contact and you drop down $125 and they give you a business license. And they're like, Go do your business. That, that's, all that, that's all that's required. Now, you need other, you know, things like insurance and other things like that. But it's quite, uh, it's quite simple. Um, so it makes sense that the mindset of the Second Great Awakening would be American. Because here you have evangelists who are telling people, it's up to you. It's not up to predestination or God's choice, but it's up to you to choose Jesus and live a holy life. What's the point? The success of the Armenian denominations in the Second Great Awakening may in part be explained by people's desire to be free from the shackles of the established order that they uh, that they fled. Uh, Yes, yes. Uh Uh-huh. Sure. Doesn't that, uh, on the other hand, kind of send a a concern to to those of us that come from a Reformed Calvinistic perspective that we have an inertia we have to push against? We're going to evangelize and do things other than the... A hundred percent. For a, for a, and I'm going to use the, the air quotes deliberately, for a Calvinist to say, well, it's all kind of determined, and so I'm not going to bother sharing the faith. That is unbelievably ungodly. Like, that is not in the Bible. The Bible tells us that we're to go proclaim the gospel among the nations. You see why I put it in quotes? A Calvinist who says that is not a Calvinist. They're speaking like a disobedient non-Christian. <laughs> okay? I mean, I, 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 I mean that. So this is really a distortion of Calvinism. You know, the idea that, well, it's all fixed, and so who really cares? But nevertheless, that is in a lot of people's minds, whether wittingly or unwittingly. 
Okay. Um, so the drive that made America. Um, oh, you know, I didn't put that in there. Well, anyway, so soon the Methodists were the most populous denomination in the nation, followed by the Baptists. Now, Methodist success, I mentioned, is partially due to the work of Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch. Um, Asbury was a Methodist circuit preacher who traveled throughout the colonies in 1771. Here's a long quote about uh, Francis Asbury that I thought was just astonishing at what this one person was able to achieve. Uh, Francis Asbury, the father of (coughs) American (coughs) Methodism, was born in Staffordshire, England, 1745. At the age of 21, he became an itinerant lay preacher in the Methodist movement. Five years later, in 1771, he accepted John Wesley's call for volunteers to cross the Atlantic and minister in British North America. Highly regarded for his piety, perseverance, and administrative leadership, Asbury was ordained a deacon, an elder, and general superintendent during the 1784 Christmas Conference of the Methodist Church. During his 45-year ministry in North America, Asbury rode an estimated 130,000 miles, preaching more than 10,000 sermons and ordaining an estimated 700 clergy. Under Bishop Asbury's leadership, Methodism in North America grew from less than 1,000 members in 1771 to over 200,000 in 1816, from 1,000 to more than 200,000 in just a few short years. <clears throat> remarkable. It's remarkable what one individual, one man or one woman is actually able to accomplish for Jesus. In my own, this is me preaching it myself. I wonder if this sort of thing is even possible in an age where we have we have so much of this important to do and and Netflix mm-hmm. and just wasting time on the internet. Is that even possible? I don't it, that uh, there being people like this in the church today is uh, there's going to have there's a lot of inertia we have to push back against if any of us really yeah, want to make it's, it's, an enormous impact for Jesus. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. It, 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 that kind of a that kind of growth is inconceivable almost. It is. It is. It's 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 absolutely it, it's remarkable it what is. one person think about what, think about a thousand people that were so gripped by Jesus, that they live their whole lives for, for that. What could actually, what should, what could actually happen? Sorry, yes, sir. Uh-huh. Just one <clears throat> um, I was raised as an, as an Episcopalian. Yes. And in the, in the Episcopalian faith and so forth and so on. And I had the experience of going through high school with a utopian socialist. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting dichotomy to say the least. Yes, yes. And what, I, what, I, what I'm wondering is uh, how one as a believer um, says that this is the only way to be true for life. That, that, that Jesus is, do you mean? Yes. Ah, well, if you, 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 um, uh, you probably are aware you were just quoting Jesus in John 14, 6, you right. know, where he says that. And... Um, I think if we, this, this is, I'll answer this very briefly because we haven't even really gotten into the main part of the second grade away because we have to be so quick. But um, for a, uh, anyone who's a, who's a Christian and who, who could rightly take that name on themselves mm-hmm. is a person who realizes that um, in Jesus Christ, there is someone who is utterly unique in all of the world. He claimed, but he also acted like a perfect man, but also the, the, the perfect God, God come in the flesh. And so once we've decided on who Jesus is, uh, and, and, and when we come to, if we really believe what he says about himself, that he is God come down in the flesh, God among us, God with us, then uh, it seems like not a far stretch of logic that we can uh, perfectly trust everything that he said at that point. Mm. And so when he said that he's the only way to God, it's very, it rattles people, you know, because people don't like that. They, people want to, we want to keep our options open, especially in America, right? <laughs> yes, yes. You know? Um, and yet uh, he made these claims about himself that he's the only way, the, the, the truth and the, and, and the life and the only way to come to God. So at that point, that's where I just, I fall on Jesus and his promise. And I say, I say, you know, I've been criticized for that. And I say, you're not criticizing me for believing that. You're criticizing Jesus. You're saying he was wrong. So you take it up with him, okay? (laughs) 
Now, let me, um, uh, let me point out that going, it, it's, a, it's a good question. Thank you very much. Now, let me point out that <clears throat> if Edwards and Whitfield were the two key figures in the Great Awakening of the colony, there was really only one major figure in the Second Great Awakening, and his name was Charles Grandison Finney. He was a Connecticut man converted in uh, 1821. He perfected the revivalistic approach to evangelism. Now, Finney was originally ordained as a Presbyterian, he later rejected the fundamental tenets of Reformed theology, like predestination and, and, you know, the five points of Calvinism, whatever you want to call it. Now, some of the new measures of revivalism invented by Finney were extended preaching services, where they would do these things for hour after hour after hour. Um, you're all like, thank the Lord we're in a Presbyterian church. We're not doing that. <laughs> um, the rise of colloquial language in sermons. So he didn't speak in these lofty tones. He would get down and say, you know, what happened to you this last week? Isn't it true that you knew you realized you needed Jesus? You know, that kind of thing. Um, the anxious bench. This is kind of one of my favorite in sort of a, a funny way, kind of one of my favorites. I'll explain the anxious bench. Um, and calling, uh, uh, calling out notorious sinners by name as he preached. I know that you've been drinking. I know that you're committing adultery. I know that you're doing this. And he would name people from the, from the, 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 the pulpit, you know. Um, now, the anxious bench, um, this is actually a picture of an anxious bench in, in kind of a, a, a modern day type of, of setting. It was a spot where people would come and sit uh, who were considering praying to receive Christ. Now, one person described it as an evangelistic pressure cooker, you know? So it's like, it's like, as I'm preaching the word of God, if you feel the spirit of God drawing you and tugging you to Jesus, then come sit in this spot. And a person would go up there and would just like plop down. And then the preacher would really focus all of his energy and his efforts on that one person and trying to get them to come and trying to persuade them. See, so, so a pressure cooker is a good way of of putting it. So you would come and sit on the anxious bench and then maybe you would be convinced that you, you needed, uh, you needed Jesus. Um, now happily, uh, and this is a really good thing. Uh, many people, Finney, as well as many people, Presbyterians, uh, Anglicans, whomever, Baptists, um, believed in those days that black people, uh, should be part of, of this awakening. And so you had a lot of black people who, uh, who, who came. There was a mixing of the races, which that was not happening outside of, of, of this in these days. Uh, before slavery was made illegal uh, uh, in England and then later in America, and of course slavery still existed as an institution until the 18, uh, 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 Lincoln in 18, the 1860s. Um, and uh, Finney also believed that women deserved to be trained for ministry as well as men. Um, so I think that's a wonderful thing. He later was the president of Oberlin College in, in Ohio, and he wrote books on revival and systematic theology. Now, the region in which Finney preached, upstate uh, New York and some in, in New Jersey, eventually became known as the Burned Over District. Now, this was what we would call the most revivaled area where people just, uh, they heard this preaching so many times, so many times again and again and again and again, kind of the same message again and again, that they just became deaf to it, right? Their, they, their ears kind of grew callous to, to what they were hearing. And so you had people who, who just weren't affected by this kind of preaching anymore. It really was uh, kind of a one-dimensional preaching. And, and that brings us to this um, one very negative feature of the Second Great Awakening, and that is its overemphasis on emotion. All right. So Finney saw revival as a well-planned experience that could be replicated elsewhere. And everything in the worship service or the revival meeting was aimed at, um, at ratcheting up people's emotions. Right. Everything was calculated to stir up your emotions so that your will would collapse or weaken. And then you would give in and surrender to Jesus. Okay. So... I'm very proud of my little clip art right there. That's a very good way of putting it. You know, th they were trying to, they would, they would so focus on the emotions at the exclusion of the head that it ended up really weakening the movement, right? So it would be like, well, I'm going to read one verse out of the Bible. In fact, I'm sorry to start, I won't name names, but I, I see a lot of uh, modern preachers do this. They'll, they'll maybe read one verse out of the Bible and then they close the Bible and they just give a talk about whatever they want to talk about, right? And, and, and the emphasis there is let's not so much worry about what's in here. We need to worry about what's in here, 
No, no, no. We need to actually worry about both. There needs to be something in here out of God's word, but it also does need to stir us up emotionally. Do you hear me, Presbyterians? It's true that we can so focus on that that we don't focus on this. Have you ever been in a worship service where you could tell that things were a little bit too calculated, where it's like the timing of the music in the exact way the preacher would lay it out? You know, and you hear the music in the background and everybody's getting very, very serious and sober. And then he kind of says it just this way. And you, you're like, I feel a little bit manipulated right now. You know, that he's really trying to just play on my emotions so that I'll do whatever. Pray to receive Christ or, you know, move the decimal uh, one spot in my check for the donation. You, you know what I mean? That, that's a really bad thing. The idea of. Uh, an altar call, really, like come down front and you're going to have this emotional uh, meeting with Jesus. Th- that is Phineism 101, okay? Now, I'm, I'm very happy to say I believe that uh, a lot of people have come to faith that way. I mean, the main thing is they're hearing something of God's word preached and then they come to faith on that basis. What makes me real nervous is a person who believes, well, I know I'm born again because I remember 25 years ago I went down front. I signed the card. The minister said, repeat these words after me. And I repeated them. And so I know I've been born again. Now, I haven't been to church in 25 years. I I, I beat my children. You know, I'm a complete crook and and an alcoholic. But it doesn't matter because I I did the magic. I did the spell. It's really a spell. You know, I did the spell. I repeated the incantation. And I know I'm not going to hell. Do do you hear how dangerous that is? Well, I think that was one of the the effects of, of the great... Of the Great Awakening. Um, now, I'll give you one example of this. During the Second Great Awakening, one spectator of one of these revivalistic sermons, he complained of that the evangelist was not really giving them any truth, not giving them anything for the head, but just trying to scare them, scare the bejesus out of them. I hope that's not a bad expression. He was trying to scare people to death so that they would um, uh, so that they would respond in in the way that he wanted. Um, Sorry, I don't, is that, I looked, I was like, is that Al Gore? If it is, I'm not trying to, it's not supposed to be him, okay? <laughs> it's really not a political thing. Um, so this one guy, he, um, he complained about this evangelist failure to inform his hearers and utilizing crass methods to engender fear and the absence of cognition, you know, intelligible information about Christ and sin. Here's what he reported. The evangelist's message was on the parable of Dives and Lazarus. That's the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. There was nothing of the love of Christ, nor of the guilt of sin. There was nothing to awaken the conscience. And then he quotes him, hell, hell, hell was the one cry and the sole object aimed at was to produce a sensation of intensified torture of physical self-feeling. The skill shown in the wording was great. So the guy was probably a good orator, you know. And the whole object of the study appeared to be the elimination of every idea or thought. You get that? It was evidently here the chief labor of preparation had been bestowed. So this is what happens when you beat on a person's will and their emotions apart from the truth of God's word coming into their mind. You know? Now, when I preach, my, I always aim to inform the mind, but I don't want it to just stay there. I always want to get to your heart by the end of the sermon, or I failed, okay? And that was where there was a, um, a serious weakness in the, the Second Great Awakening. Um, <clears throat> you've seen these boys before, haven't you? Uh, this heightened emphasis on emotions and on like a special word, a special revelation from God, it laid the, found, uh, the, gr- uh, excuse me, the groundwork for some much deeper errors. Very shortly after the Second Great Awakening, after that movement lost steam, cults like the Mormons in the 1830s, Jehovah's Witnesses in the 1870s, and Mary Baker Eddy and Christian Science in the 1870s arose. So you see, it's like this was the, the, the very unhappy long-term effects of what I believe was begun in the Second Great Awakening. Again, this em- emphasis on emotionalism. In fact, you if you have one of these in your house, you have these young men in your house, when you show them that what they're teaching is out of sync with God's word, you know what they'll tell you? Who knows? Tell me, what, what are they going to tell you? What do you need to do? What's the one thing they want you to do? 
Y'all haven't had Mormons at your house recently. (laughs) They'll say, are you willing to pray to Heavenly Father and ask Him if what we're saying is true? And when you do that, you will feel a burning in your bosom. Have y'all, have y'all not heard this? Really? You know what you need to do? When the Mormons, when the Mormons, when the Mormons come, don't go and close the shutters. Invite them in. They always do this. This is their tactic. When they see they're not getting, making any headway with you, they say, pray to Heavenly Father. That's their wording. And, and uh, ask him if the things that we're telling you are true. And, and, and when you do that, you will feel this warmth, this burning in your bosom that what these men are saying is really true. And do you know what I always tell them? There is no way I'm doing that. Because my Bible says that if even an angel from heaven is to preach another gospel like you're doing, let him be anathema. And Paul says it twice in Galatians chapter one. So no, I'm not praying your little prayer. Okay. Uh, In fact, Satan appears as an angel of light. If you feel some warmth, happy feeling uh, uh, about some message that is completely opposed to Christ, then you do know that is the work of a spirit. What spirit? Not the spirit of God. So you see, there was this very unhappy thing that happened in, in these days. Uh, because of this height, unheight, uh, this heightened emphasis on emotions. Let's look at some of the divisions that were brought out. And, and this will be kind of, have a couple pages here, but this is kind of the, well, the second to last section. The first great awakening was divided into two, uh, what I would call Christian camps, right? You had the Calvin, Calvinists and the Arminians. They were known as the new lights. Remember, this is back in the first great awakening. Um, the other main camp was not Christian or evangelical. It was the old lights or what were the liberals, um, the main main spokesmen here for the kind of the chief reformed thinkers were uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, and then the chief Arminian was John Wesley. These are Christians right here. These are Christian groups. We differ on this one little thing about election, right? And then we looked at Charles Chauncey, who did battle with Edwards. He was a a liberal. He ended up becoming a leader among the Unitarians. Um, so so that was that was what happened in the first Great Awakening. Well, there were these splinter groups that happened. These divisions that happened at the time of the Second Great Awakening later. And the first was the movement known as Restorationism. The Restoration Movement. Um, Desiring to return the 19th century Christian church to its pure primitive form, a man by the name of Thomas Campbell and his son Alexander Campbell, and later a guy called Barton Stone, they founded a movement collectively that is uh, known as Restorationism. Now, uh, Thomas Campbell was a Presbyterian who came to America in 1807. His church tried to prevent him, his Presbyterian church tried to prevent him from administering communion to those who had not been approved to receive communion. Um, He disagreed and he lost his credentials with the Presbyterians and he became a Baptist. Now, he, um, he believed in baptism by immersion and he emphasized the second return of Christ, which are very Baptistic themes. Um, But eventually the Baptists realized that he wasn't one of them either. Right. So he was disgruntled with the Presbyterians, disgruntled with the Baptists. And so he claimed his goal was, quote, a complete restoration of apostolic Christianity. And so later, his son, Alexander, and another disgruntled Presbyterian, Barton Stone, became pejoratively known as the Campbellites. Right. So all the churches that came out of this, they became known as the Campbellites. Um, Now, they founded the churches uh, that were called the Disciples of Christ and the Churches of Christ to, to this day. Um, uh, so uh, initially they were called the disciples of Christ. And then later they, they branched out into what are are known broadly as the churches of Christ. Now these still exist today. The church of Christ. I have a neighbor who lives right across the street. Very, very uh, nice man. We're, we're, we're friends, but he's part of that church. Um, now to this day, these churches teach baptismal regeneration. What is that? The baptism saves you, right? It washes away original sin. It forgives you. Um, and they tend to be, uh, well, they are very rigid in their assistant, insistence on observing the law. You have to keep enough of the law of God or else you cannot be saved, right? Um, in fact, my, my neighbor, this friend of mine, he gave me a card and it showed me the things that are necessary for salvation. And it doesn't say Jesus alone. So it's like, well, we disagree on the gospel, don't we? So anyway, 
That's the first um, movement. The second movement, I'm, uh, all of you are familiar with, I'm sure, are the Second Day Adventists. Now, this gets a little bit, I want to be nice to Seventh Day Adventists because I'm sure there are brothers and sisters um, in that movement, but th- there's a little bit of humor here. Um, they were begun by a guy called William Miller. Um, Miller was a farmer who studied his Bible uh, constantly. His focus on the books of Daniel and Revelation led him to believe that Christ was going to return 2,300 years after Ezra's return to Jerusalem because Daniel 8 refers to the, these 2,300 days. And he says, well, if we, we take day to mean year, duh, you know, then we come to um, this date of 1843 for the definite return of Christ. Now, uh, he actually said about 1843, that is, right? Now, he wrote, he wrote this. My principles in brief are that Jesus Christ will come again to this earth, cleanse, purify, and take possession of the same with all the saints sometime between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. That was a letter that he wrote to one of his, um, his colleagues. Now, the date came and went, and I, it won't surprise you to know that Jesus did not come back. And so he's like, wait, I forgot to carry a one, you know, and so he changed it. And it was a little bit later that, okay, it's a couple months later that he'll come. And Jesus again did not come. So finally he determined that October the 22nd, 1844, like, okay, sorry, I was, I was, uh, I had to like clean off my prophetic glasses. I have them on. This is the date. Well, October 22nd came and went. And of course, Jesus didn't come back. And um, this led to what, uh, an event that was known as the Great Disappointment. So the disappointment was of these followers of M- William Miller, also known as the Millerites, uh, when it didn't come. And it was kind of mean, but it got to the point where even children in the street would kind of ridicule these adults who were, part of, who were Millerites. You ridicule that, you know, you thought Jesus was going to come back and you were wrong. Now, this is a, where it gets a little bit kind of humorous. Um, one Millerite, a guy called Pickens, Proposed that Jesus was trying to return, but was presently sitting on a cloud and had to be prayed down. Um, evidently, he wasn't because he didn't. Or maybe they didn't pray fervently enough, but large numbers left the movement. Some joined the, the shakers. So the idea is like, well, Jesus is trying to come back, but he's literally stuck in a cloud. And so if we pray hard enough, he will come back. Well, that, that didn't happen. Um, The name that is really affiliated with the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a lady by the name of Ellen G. White. That's probably a name that you've you've heard if you know anything about their church. Um, Now there were, um, she claimed to be a a prophet. She wrote a lot of books, The Great Controversy and so forth. Um, Now distinct beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist movement are, number one, a strict emphasis on Saturday as the only proper Sabbath. Uh, a lot of times, uh, Seventh-day Adventist churches that don't have buildings will worship in Christian churches and Protestant churches because there's no conflict. You worship on Saturday, we worship on Sunday. They're very rigid that the only proper day to worship God is on Saturday. Um, they believe in what's called soul sleep between your, one's death and resurrection. And they also reject eternal hell for the wicked. So they teach annihilationism. What's, what's annihilationism? What does that mean? You just, you're snuffed out of existence. You cease to exist, right? Um, no, no hell for, for anybody. Um, the Seventh-day Adventists, they, they do have, they have this, uh, they have a work flavor to them as well, just like the Restorationist churches do. Now, uh, very briefly, I'll give you three positive legacies of this movement, and then we can, uh, and then I'll take any, any questions that you have. Um, three positive leg- legacies of the Second Great Awakening were, number one, abolitionism. Uh, thankfully, there were believers at the turn of that century, the turn of the 19th century, who believed that slavery was wicked and it needed to be eradicated. So you had a lot, including Finney and many others who were, were for uh, abolitionism. So I praise God for that. Second, this, this might be news to you. I just learned this a few years ago and I didn't know it. Um, Sunday school uh, originated at this time. So Sunday school does not go back a thousand years in church history. The idea, it actually came about in the Second Great Awakening. The first recorded Sunday school was held at someone's home in Virginia in 1786. Uh, What was that? 1787 was the Declaration of Independence? 1780. Ooh, boy, I told you I don't know anything after 750, uh, after uh, 1750. Yeah. Um, Well, anyway, so right right around that time, um, Sunday school was 
an effort to promote literacy, not just supplemental instruction in addition to the worship service, which is what people think of Sunday school as today. See, the reason for this is because the literacy rates were very high in early America. We might even say that uh, Sunday school was a social service uh, that the church was performing by, by holding these. So Sunday school, it was literally you come to the church or you stay at church after worship and we teach you how to read. It was school, but it was school for working people who had jobs on Monday through Friday, right? Because so many people were illiterate. So very often and shrewdly, they would teach people to read the what? The Bible, right? So that was like kind of the chief means of, of teaching people how to read. So it, did any of you know that? This is like I said, I remember reading this a couple of years ago. Yeah. So that's really, have you heard that? Have you heard that, Sandy? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it, it's a fairly innovative thing. So it does make me uh, chuckle a little bit when some people are like, it's not church if there's not Sunday school, you know, um, which, hey, OK, if, you know, some churches have it, some churches don't. But let's not pretend that it's something that's been around forever. It, it's kind of an innovative thing in the last few years. And, and uh, significantly, it came about because by and large, people were not were not literate. Uh, thirdly is mission work. And we're going to focus on this a lot next week. Um, but the third positive effect of the Great Awakening is that mission, missionary endeavor in America and abroad was a hopeful sign that the Church of Jesus Christ was still strong. People believed in this impulse to get the gospel out. Um, in 1810, the ABCFM was founded uh, out of an event called the Haystack Prayer Meeting at Williams College in, uh, in 1810. Uh, the 19th century has been called by the, the Yale historian Kenneth Scott Lauderet the Great Century of Missions. In fact, this is pretty cool about the 1800s. More people across the globe heard the good news in the 19th century than in any other century. Um, so we'll focus on that next week. Uh, let me close out by saying it's fair to say that the legacy of the Second Great Awakening is mixed. On the one hand, many people certainly came to faith in Jesus. But on the other, it opened the door to this overemphasis uh, on emotions, and it put in motion the mass evangelism movement with its accompanying weaknesses. Uh, and furthermore, the emphasis on a less cognitive faith prepared the ground for serious deviations from the faith in the decades after the movement died out. Lastly, it's too bad that the Second Great Awakening wasn't from top to bottom more robust, because in the next century, the Christian faith would be presented with a, a grand opportunity, but it would also encounter some of the most serious threats it had faced since the book of Acts. And so that's what we'll look at next week. These two major threats and one enormous opportunity that thankfully many in the church uh, took advantage of. Okay, any questions about the Second Great Awakening or anything that we have uh, we've studied over the past 17 Sundays? Yes, Verna. Um, last week there was a program on um, Martin Luther, and they said at that time that uh, most of the uh, Germans learned to read in the church and to read the Bible. Mm, mm. Yeah, that, that's. I, I'm, I'm sure that, that that sounds very credible. I'm sure that that's that's true. Um, the with the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg in the 1460s, uh, it made widespread reading possible for the first time in human history. Because anything that you or I or anyone in those days could have read, it had to be handwritten and hand copied. And so uh, just owning writings of any kind was unbelievably rare. You had to be very, very wealthy to own anything. That was, uh, you know, credibly copied and, and recorded. But once once that changed, literacy just exploded across Europe and, and the rest of the world. And the main book that people wanted to read was the Bible. So I, I love that about the, the Lutheran church. That's a, a really good thing. Any other questions or, or comments? So, so Wesley, his whole life was a part of the Methodist Church. He never broke, uh, excuse me, was a part of the Church of England. He never broke with the Church of England. 
So uh, originally, you could think of Methodism as a kind of a revival movement within the Church of England. Uh, I, I, can, I, I can check back on that. I want to make sure I'm telling you exactly right, but I'm 90, 95% sure that his whole life he was a member in, in good standing in the Church of England. But eventually his movement grew so, so large that, uh, that it was functionally independent from, uh, from the Church of England. Um, so I, I think there were various reasons for it. One is that uh, a lot of people, they don't get this. Every, for most people, they understand Wesley as the originator and the founder of the Methodist movement. That's really not true. Uh, Wesley and Whitfield were, were deeply engaged simultaneously at the very beginning of it. And whereas uh, Whitfield had this impulse to just go out into the highways and the hedges and the fields and preach to everybody who would listen, uh, Wesley was the type who came along after him. Uh, Wesley was one of the most capable e- organizers and administrators that the world has ever seen. I mean, that's how you had these Methodist churches that, uh, that developed the way that they did. And as I mentioned, he, he set aside Thomas Asbury and, uh, and, and, uh, and Thomas, uh, 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 Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch to be the superintendents of the Methodist church in, in America. It was a very smart move because they were very capable. They were very capable as well. Uh, now, at the time, one reason I think for this, uh, not a, 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 a new church being formed, but him, him uh, functionally breaking away from the Church of England, even though he didn't renounce his credentials, is that the Church of England is Calvinistic. At least it was at the time. You go back and you read the, the, uh, the 39 articles of the Church of England. They are reformed and Calvinistic. Um, in fact, the Church of England has technically been Calvinistic uh, uh, all, of its, all of its history until I think it was in the 1970s that they said, eh, you know, people just aren't really creedal these days. They said, well, we don't really care if you actually believe these, uh, you know, these certain points in the 39 articles. So I, I think, I think that, that must have been a part of it as well, that he very much disagreed with the reformed emphasis on soteriology. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Rich. Back when I was a traveling film lecturer, and I did that for about 10 years all over the United States and Canada, yeah. I would get booked into these Seventh-day Adventist colleges and private boarding schools and things, like Southwest Union College and Columbia Union College. I mean, from California to, yeah, yeah. to Maryland and yeah. Texas and Pennsylvania, and they would, uh, you know, they're vegetarian. Oh. textured soy protein that looked like meat, you know. And uh, these, these shows, I believe, as I remember, they were almost always on Saturday night, as if, they're, as if their Sabbath maybe ended around 6 p.m. and they were ready for some entertainment <laughs> at night. I, Interesting. I, I have that straight anyway. Interesting. Okay. To get exposed to that world of Seventh-day Adventism. Are they... Uh, um, do they tend to be literal six-day creationists? I think they are. I'm not sure I got into that one. Okay, because I was wondering if there was ever any sparks that flew, because I think they are pretty rigid on six-day creationism. Do you know, Dave? Does anyone know? Brent Cunningham's were. Okay, okay. Well, it's good you avoided it if they were, or else you might have not gotten any more invitations. <laughs> okay. Maybe one more. Any, any last questions before we break? All right. Very good. Well, thank you all for coming. Well, thank you all for coming.